Come on, give two people a high five. Tell them that's who he is, and you can be seated. Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad you came to church? I want to talk this morning about a hero from our Bible named David, who I believe can probably help us out a little bit. If you have your Bible, open it up to 1 Samuel chapter number 17. We'll start around verse number 32. But before we get there, I want to give a little bit of the backstory to what we're about to see. So David in the Bible, if, if you've ever heard of him, he started out as a young boy or a shepherd boy, young man. And the Bible says that there was a king in Israel, in Judah, named Saul. And the Bible says that God was going to raise up another king. So he told Samuel, the prophet, he said, I'm going to send you to Jesse's house. And at Jesse's house, you are going to go. And when you get there, I'm going to tell you who the next king of Israel is going to be. It's going to be one of Jesse's sons. And the Bible says that Samuel begins to walk up to Jesse's house and they see him coming from afar and everybody starts to kind of freak out because here comes the prophet of God to their house, which in those day and age specifically could either uh, pronounce a blessing on you or they could tell you God's not happy with you. So they were, they were immediately interested in what Samuel had to say. They said, do you come in peace? Do you come peaceably? And Samuel says, I come peaceably. They said, oh, thank God. They said, well, well, what is it? And Jesse, uh, Jesse came up and he said, well, what are you here for? He said, one of your boys is going to be the next king of Israel. And don't you know, old Jesse's uh, moxie probably went up about 10 levels as soon as he heard that. Because he started thinking about, man, I don't know what all the benefits are of your son being king, but there's got to be some benefits to your son being the king. So he says, I tell you what, I'll go get my boys. He said, and we'll line them up in front of you, and you can just pick whichever one you want to pick. The Bible says he goes and he gets all of his boys that look the part, that sound the part, that, that, that mankind that you and me would have picked. And he lines them up in front of uh, Samuel. And, he, and, and Samuel had a horn filled with oil. And he was going to go and he was going to pour that oil on the next king of Israel. And he goes to the first boy, and the boy looks the part. He looks exactly like a king should look. And he goes to pour the oil, and before he can pour it, uh, the Lord speaks to Samuel, and he says, that's not him. And he goes to the next boy, he says, that's not him. Goes to the next guy, says, that's not him. Finally, Samuel looks at Jesse, he said, Jesse, he said, do you have any other sons? And, and Jesse said, well, I've got one more. And and and. Samuel says, well, where is he? He said, well, he's out in the field tending the sheep. And Samuel says, that's exactly what I am looking for. Bring me to this boy. In other words, uh, our Bible, the, the left side of it, from Genesis to Malachi, uh, it's what we call the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, there are plenty of types and shadows or pictures of what Jesus is like. Later on, when Jesus is born, uh, in the New Testament, the Bible says that Mary and Joseph, they had, gone, they had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and they were on their way back home one time, and they looked and they realized they forgot Jesus somewhere, their son. Now, he's 12 years old, and for you and for me, that ought to make us feel a little bit, a, a little bit better about our parenting that even Mary and Joseph lost Jesus. Can I get a witness? <laughs> so they sit there and they go. Joseph, are we forgetting something? And he's like, no, I got my cell phone right here. We're good. And, and, and he goes, she goes, no, 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 no. There's something else. What, what is it? Jesus. Where is Jesus? We got to go find him. So they go back and they find Jesus in the temple talking with people about the scripture, reasoning, teaching in the scripture at 12 years old. And his mom said, Jesus, we were worried about you. We, 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 we were looking for you. And Jesus said, you should have known I would be about my father's business. You see, Jesse thought, I need to bring him my sons that look the part when the reality was, is God was looking for a son who was about his father's business. Jesse was a herdsman, so David was taking care of his dad's business. 
The Bible says that Samuel comes up to him, says, you're exactly what I'm looking for. And he pours the oil on his head and he says, you're going to be the next king of Israel. And I'll bet you uh, uh, in today's society, if we knew who the next president was going to be or we knew who the next king was going to be, the moment that they were anointed, the moment that the oil hit their forehead, we would be moving them into the White House or a palace. But that's not what happened at all. The Bible says that David continued to work for his dad so much so that the Philistines, which was a group of people that were against the Israelites, God's people, they came to wage war against Israel. And the Bible says they came to this great valley and a champion giant named Goliath walked out into the middle of the valley and began to curse the God of Israel and curse the people of Israel. And he was saying vile things and he was talking about how he would kill everybody. And he said, if, if you guys think y'all are tough, send your best fighter out here. I'll fight him. And whoever wins the losing side, everybody becomes a slave. And everybody was terrified. They called up all of the army. They called up all the National Guard. And they went to meet the Philistines on the other edge of the valley. Part of that group was David's brothers because they were older than David. David wasn't old enough to go to battle yet. And the Bible says that after some time that Jesse, being a good father, was concerned about his sons. And he took the son that he could trust. And he took David and he said, David... I want you to get some bread and some cheese, and I want you to take it to your brothers. I want you to give them the bread, and I want you to give the cheese to those who are in authority over your brothers. In other words, Jesse was making sure that his sons were taken care of, but he was still honoring those that were in authority. The Bible says that Jesse uh, gives the stuff to David. David takes off in a chariot and he carries it to his brothers and he sits there and he, he kind of looks like a, a, a Pizza Hut delivery guy because he's bringing the bread and the cheese, which sounds like a pretty good lunch to me if you're uh, looking at the clock at all, praise the Lord. <laughs> and he walks up with the, the bread and the cheese and he says, hey guys, dad sent me to make sure that you guys had plenty to eat. And they're all talking and they were probably talking the way a family would talk. How's things at home? How's dad? How's mom? How's life? David's going, everything's fine. And then all of a sudden in the distance, what had been said for days and possibly weeks was said again. The giant began to rail and curse and began to say all types of vile things that he was going to do to Israel. He began to say that there was no God in Israel. He began to say that the great God Jehovah was not a true God. And all of the sudden, all the men who were there began to turn into mice. They began to shake and quake and were petrified again. But there was one amongst them, one who was anointed. And the Bible says when David heard the same thing that the other men heard, he responded differently. He began to say, who is saying that about Israel? Who is saying that? Why are they? Why is nobody doing anything? Do, do, am I the only one that sees and hears what this guy is doing? And all of a sudden, David's brothers say, David, you only came out here so you could maybe see the battle. You need to get back there and mess with those sheep. You need to get back in your place. You need to go now. And David did not answer his brothers. He simply said, I will not stand idly by if that guy's looking for somebody to fight I am more than willing to fight because I'm not going to let somebody curse the God of my father the God of this nation and my God in my ears somebody's got to rise up and do something about it all the other men around said said well th this little shepherd boys come out here with some bread and some cheese now all of a sudden he wants to fight and the Bible says in verse 36 that they went and told in verse 31 they went and told Saul and Saul was brought to David. This is where we pick up, verse 32. 1 Samuel 17, verse 32. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail. Don't be intimidated because of this giant. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. If you're going to come out of this summer stronger than you went into this summer, you've got to make the decision right now that your days of being intimidated are over. You're never going to be qualified for every position that God places you in. 
Matter of fact, when you get qualified in man's eyes, oftentimes that disqualifies you in God's eyes. God calls those whom he desires to do, uh, to do a certain thing to do it, and he doesn't ask our permission. Somebody say amen. amen. So for us, we're not going to be intimidated. Don't, uh, don't let your heart fail. Let no man's heart fail. Listen, so many times in life, you're going to have the opportunity for your heart to fail. Uh, just recently, uh, a friend of mine, he was in a, in, a, in a significant court case. It was a family thing. And, man, we were believing God that, that God was going to do exactly what he said he would do. And there was plenty of times to uh, let our heart fail. And there were times when we just cried together. And there were times that we just got together and hugged one another. But every single time that we had the opportunity, we said, we, go, we know God can deliver us and he will deliver us. And in the right moment, God's going to show up. Somebody's got to make the decision and summer 2018 that your days of intimidation are over because God is still God regardless of what our circumstance looks like we're not going to be intimidated Christians have gotten real good at backing up but I believe Christians are going to get real good at having a backbone there are things and seasons and times in your life where there is conflict and if you withdraw from the conflict you will have to fight that same giant next year but if you will stand up and fight that giant. Now, listen, guys and gals, don't get all UFC on me. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Preacher said we can fight. Praise God. Don't go to work with boxing gloves on. All right? It's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. There's going to be things said against you, about you. There's going to be things that are talked about in your presence. But at the end of it all, listen, do not let your heart fail. Do not be intimidated. Somebody say amen. amen. Give God a hand of praise if you're not going to be intimidated this summer. <laughs> David said, don't let anybody's heart fail. And Saul said to David, he said, you can't fight him. Verse 33, you're just a youth. And he was a, he was a man of war from the time he was a baby. Verse 34, and David said to Saul, he said, listen here. He said, I keep my daddy's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and I hit him, I smote him, and I delivered it out of his mouth. I pulled that lamb out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and I hit him again, and I killed him. Your servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that has delivered me out of the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and I hope God is with you. He said, you can't fight this boy. You can't fight this, this giant. You're just, you're just a boy. David said, I may look like a boy, but I keep my dad's sheep. And a lion and a bear came in, and the lion and bear wasn't trying to get me. The lion and the bear stole a lamb and took it. And I left the 99 sheep that were safe, and I pursued the one that was lost. And when I finally found the one that was going around like a roaring lion, I pried his jaws open and I pulled that helpless lamb out of his mouth and then I grabbed that lion by the beard and I killed the lion that was trying to kill the sheep. I know I look like a boy. See, here's what I'm trying to tell you. I know to the world and to people that rise up against you, you just look like you, but they have no idea how many lions and bears lay dead in your past. If God has ever done it one time for you, he will do it again. David said, listen, he said, that guy looks big. He said, but he doesn't look like he has claws. That guy looks big. He said, but he doesn't look like he's got a big mane like a lion. He said, I know for a fact, if God has ever delivered me, he will deliver me again. There is no way on this planet I'm going to stand idly by and let him stand out there and curse God and curse me and try to do all this other stuff. Number one, if you're taking notes, what you say about you is far more important than what they say about you. In other words, it's not what they call you, it's what you answer to. 
Saul said, you're just a boy. David said, I may look like a boy, Jack, but I'm going to tell you something right now. I fought a lion and I fought a bear, and the bear and the lion lost. He said, no, you, you can't. You're just a boy. He said, you don't understand. I keep my daddy's sheep. See, it's one thing when you defend yourself. It's another thing when you go to war for somebody else. The Bible said that Jesus was teaching one time, and he was talking about how he dealt with people that are lost. And he said this. He said, he will leave. If there's a shepherd that has 100 sheep, he'll leave the 99, and he'll go find the one that's lost. David's sitting there, and he's literally doing exactly what Jesus says a good shepherd would do. He goes and pursues the lost sheep. And before you know it, he walks out of there with a testimony, knowing down deep in who he is, that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will not only fight for you, he will fight for you and you will get the victory it's an overwhelming place and position of peace when you begin to come to the understanding that listen it's what I say about me it's not what you say about me and more importantly it's what God says about us well what does God say I'll just give you a few he said you're the head and not the tail he says that you are blessed and I love this you cannot be cursed Blessed, it doesn't say you won't be cursed, it says you cannot be cursed. It's like you're walking around with a force field around you that said the curse just can't get on me anymore. Why not? Because the blood of Jesus set me free. Blessed and cannot be cursed. You're an heir and a joint heir with Christ Jesus. You are clothed in Christ. You're the righteousness of God in Christ. You're a child of the Most High God. Whatever you put your hand to will prosper. You may just look like a boy, but they have no idea about the lions and the bears in your past. If God has ever delivered you once, you are on the absolute threshold of being delivered again. It doesn't matter what they say. It matters what you say. David said, moreover, I love that, verse 37, moreover, God delivered me, and he'll do it again. Verse 38, Saul armed David with his armor. I think that's very nice of him. The king gave him his armor. The reality was, is the king should have been out there fighting the giant. Somebody say amen. Amen. But Saul said, well, if you're going to get killed, you just well get killed in some good-looking armor. And he gave him his armor and he put a helmet on his head and he armed him with a coat of mail and David girded his sword up upon his armor and he essayed to go. That literally means he tried to walk because he hadn't proven the armor. And David said to Saul, I can't go with these. He said, I haven't proved them. He said, and David took them off. He said, I can't move around in this, king. Yesterday at the house, my my son was outside throwing baseballs up and hitting them, and the little dog would run and get the ball and bring it back. He'd throw the baseball up and hit it again, and the cycle was continuing. And then he said, I want to put on my catching equipment. He put on his catching equipment, and he's out there, and it was hilarious because he had my six-year-old daughter pitching to him. So the ball was bouncing about 99.9% of the time when it got to him. But then she comes up with a great idea. She says, I need to put the catching equipment on. He says, no problem. So he puts the catching equipment on. He's built for a nine-year-old. She's six years old. It comes up to her hips, got the chest protector on that covers her down to her knees, puts the helmet on that you could literally just spin like a top on her head and it wouldn't even touch her nose. And she's, she's walking, and she goes, hey, Dad. I said, yeah. She said, I should be on All Stars too. I said, I agree. But the catching equipment wasn't built for her. Saul's armor was custom made for that king, not the new king. David said, I can't wear this. And he takes it off. What I'm trying to say, number two, you've got to be yourself. You were born an original, don't die a copy. I remember when we first started the church almost six years ago now, and I remember, I, for whatever reason, I, I thought it was really important to wear a suit and tie every, every time I preached. So I did. And man, I had a suit and tie, boom, and I just thought, man, and I just thought, man, I, I think that's a good thing to do. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I like a suit and tie. I wore a suit and tie yesterday. 
But at the same time, I remember I, I, the reason that I did it was because I felt like I was supposed to because I'd seen other people do it. One day I walked into Home Depot. I think it was Home Depot. If it wasn't, it was a store like that. And this young man comes up to me. He goes, hey, are you that preacher? I said, I am that preacher. Praise the Lord. <laughs> he, said, he said, New Heights? I said, yeah. He said, man. He said, it's cool to see you without all that church stuff on. <laughs> I said, church stuff? He goes, yeah. He said, man, you look like an attorney. Made me all nervous. And they said, or a weatherman. <laughs> and I went home. I said, Chris, my wife, I said, babe, I said, I said, I met a guy today who goes to our church. And he said how I dressed made him nervous. She said, what do you think about that? I said, I don't know. I said, but I don't want to make people nervous. And then she said, my, my wife has the, the, this way of just saying things super plain. And she goes, I think you just ought to wear what you want to wear. I said, well, there's a concept. <laughs> and I began to dress how I wanted. And all of a sudden, I started to sound like me, and I didn't sound as much like the people that I'd heard my whole life. I started to seem different and feel different. And I can't describe it other than I just felt like I could move in my own armor instead of being clanked together in somebody else's. Don't try to mimic everybody you see because God made some things that are divinely specific to you. You will reach people that I will never have a chance with. And I will reach people that you'll never have a chance with. And this is the entire plan of God. New Heights Church exists. If you know it, help me say it. We exist to love people and point them to Christ. But there's people that you know I'll never get a chance to love. There's people that I know you'll never get a chance to love. Wear your own armor. Carry your own tools. Somebody say amen. amen. The Bible says that he took it off in verse 40. He took his staff, his stick, and he chose five smooth stones out of the brook and he put them in a shepherd's bag which he had even in a script he also had a little piece of paper in there and his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine and the Philistine came on and drew near unto David and the man that bare the shield went before him in other words Goliath is starting to come out into the field. David is headed towards him. And Goliath has a guy that carries his shield for him. The Bible says that David took off Saul's armor and he went into the brook and he chose five smooth stones out of the brook. Anytime you see a number in the Bible, most oftentimes it will connect to something else. Five is often the number of grace. But it also uh, references the five-fold ministry. The five-fold ministry is like what I'm a part of. And the Bible says that it is for the equipping, the training, the educating, the informing, the equipping of the saints. That's everybody who's called on the name of the Lord. So by the definition that the Bible uses for saint in that regard, it is not a few people that have been selected after they have died. It is everybody who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the scripture says that the fivefold ministry is for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. In other words, if each one of us wins somebody to God that is outlandishly more effective than everybody coming into a church watching a preacher and hoping that the preacher wins everybody to the Lord. Does that make sense? So the five-fold ministry is for the equipping of the saints. 
the Bible says that he didn't just choose five stones, he chose five smooth stones. Now, I'm an engineer and I have a, 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 a background in ballistics. You cannot throw something, shoot something, sling something straight and anticipate it to be accurate if it is rough, if it has jagged edges, if it has issues. What you're going to do is you're going to ru ruin what's called the ballistic integrity of the projectile. So you've got to have something smooth if you want it to be accurate. In other words, when we come to the house of God, it's important that our first touch team not only loves people, but we love people in a smooth way because there are some ways that you can love people that totally turns them off. Somebody say amen. amen. How many, how many of y'all have ever been in church for more than like five minutes? You know exactly what I'm talking about. When you walk in and all of a sudden it's like everybody's staring at you and everybody, you feel like you're out of place. No, we do everything in our power in this, uh, in this group of believers to try to make people that are close to God feel loved, try to make people that are far from God feel loved, and everybody in the middle. Because our cause to love them and point them to Christ, that means we're going to have to be very smooth in the process. We don't want the jagged edges of our life and we've all got them to put us off course. The Bible says that those five stones that he pulled them out of the brook, well, if anybody knows what water does, water runs downhill and it finds the lowest part of the topography or the land. In other words, you don't find five smooth select stones at the top of the mountain. You find them in the bottom of the valley. David was not just a warrior, he was not just a king, he was also a psalmist. He wrote beautiful psalms. The book of Psalms is filled with psalms or poems or songs that David actually wrote. One of them is very famous, Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I believe it's very possible that this is actually whenever that psalm or that poem came in his mind because he's walking to a place where everybody said he's going to die. The shadow of death, the sun may have been behind Goliath and may have been overshadowing where he was reaching down in the bottom of that brook to pull out those five smooth stones. But the reality was as those smooth stones came from the lowest place in the valley. What I'm trying to tell you is when you go through a valley, you might even get knocked down on your face, but bless God, pick something up while you are there that will help you later. Don't let your valley experience just leave you wounded without picking up some weapons for your next stage. The Bible says he goes down and he picks up the five smooth stones. You don't find smooth stones on the top of a mountain. If you want a stone to be smooth, it's going to have to be in a riverbed. It's going to have to have water flowing across it. And over time, what will happen is that water will smooth out all the rough places. That's why the Bible says to not neglect the gathering of believers because what's happening when you and me get in this room, it's as if we're put underneath the great brook of heaven and the washing of the water of the word is just knocking off our rough spots. It's knocking off those issues so that we can be better and we can be more effective and we can be more accurate when it comes to loving people and pointing them to Christ. David reaches down and he says, there's five stones I can work with. And he put it down into his bag. The Bible says there was a script there, which means there was a message there, which means he didn't just need the smooth stones. He also needed the word. You see, there's something about the word of God when it gets in your mouth that begins to change your life. Everybody just raise your right hand just like this. I, Brian Hallam, hereby authorize you to use the word of God in your own mouth. <laughs> Whoever your favorite Christian is, in your moment when you're going through the valley of the shadow of death, you may or may not be able to get them on the phone. You're going to need to carry the word with you. The Bible says that he takes those five smooth stones and he went and he began to draw near to the Philistine. Verse 41, the Philistine came and drew near to David. The man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained or he hated him for he was but a youth. He was ruddy or red-headed and he was of fair countenance. In other words, David had the same problem I had. He was very handsome. <laughs> and the Philistine said unto David, I, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? Staves means sticks. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. 
Can I just say this? Please, being, please stop being shocked that your enemy hates you. Please stop being surprised that he stands in the valley and shouts at you every morning. The devil's not going to turn over. He's not going to roll over. He's not going to do it. The only thing he responds to is whenever he is dealt with directly. He was yelling every morning and every man there could have rose up and began to declare the word of God over the situation and gone and fight it, but they didn't. He was waiting for the word of God to be released under the anointing that was on David's life. The Bible says that he began to hate David and curse David. And the Philistines said to David, come here to me. I'm going to give your flesh to the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field. It's pretty intense. But David said to the Philistine, You come against me with a sword and with a spear. You come against me with a shield. But I come in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day will the Lord deliver you into my hand and I will smite you. I will take your head from your shoulders and I will give your carcasses to the host of the Philistines this day and unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth and all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew to meet David, that David hasted, or David quickly began to run towards the army to meet the Philistine. Let me just say it like this. Don't ever run against your enemy with your mouth shut. The most powerful thing you have is the word of the living God in your mouth. And when the enemy begins to declare all the things that he's going to do to you, if you will begin to declare all the things that God's going to do to him, you'll begin to see the hand of God move in your life. Come on, give God a big hand of praise. We're gonna see God move. We're not going to be intimidated. Our heart's not going to fail. We're not going to die some fabricated copy of somebody else. And when the enemy begins to rise up and begins to declare all the negative things over our life, we're going to make sure he knows that the God of angel armies has not gone slow. He's not gone weak. He's not gone complacent. And at the mention of his name, every demon in hell begins to tremble. He began to run towards him, the Bible says. And he began to say, you think you're going to feed me to the birds? I'm telling you, the birds are not going to go hungry today, but they will not be having a kosher meal, praise the Lord. He ran towards the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag felt that piece of paper and was reminded by the power of the word and he took their stone and he slang it and that's how you know David was from East Texas praise the Lord <laughs> and he slang it and he smote the Philistine in his forehead so hard that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth so David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran, stood upon the Philistine and took his sword, took Goliath's sword, drew it out of the sheath, slew him and cut his head off. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. I grew up in a different time when the, the parental advice for dealing with bullies was to hit them in the nose. I know that's not politically correct, but I also want you to know it still works. But it was a very different time. And I remember one time I went to my dad because there were several guys that were kind of giving me a hard time in athletics. And he said to me, he said, I said, Dad, there's several of them. 
I said, you know, they're, they're starting to pick on me and stuff like that. And dad said, hit the biggest one. I said, come again? <laughs> he said, just hit the biggest one. He said, you whoop the big ones, the little ones will run off. What I'm trying to tell you is those things that are railing and yelling against you, and it sounds like there's a thousand things behind it. Maybe it's debt that you've got yourself in. Maybe it's I'm looking for a better job and I can't, I can't find it. Maybe your marriage is on the rocks. Maybe your kids are, are far from God. And it just, it just feels like there's a big giant and there's a hundred giants behind them. You're going to find out there's only one giant and everything else is running as soon as it falls. As soon as you... I, I love, I love this, 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 this idea. If there's a big problem in your life, if there's an elephant in the room... The first step, shoot the elephant. Stop trying to figure out all the small stuff in your life when there's one big thing that's just totally taking up too much space. It didn't say Goliath was a man like every other man says he was a giant. That means that it, he, he literally took up more real estate than everybody else. There are things in our life and they just take up more time. Maybe it's, you know, hey, I'm not against social media. We use it to try to declare the name of the Lord. But maybe social media has become an elephant or a giant in your life and you can't go five minutes without looking at it. And you're like, oh my gosh, they did this, they did this. Oh my gosh. Ah. And it's just become this giant. Maybe it's the internet. Maybe it's the television. Maybe it's a relationship outside your marriage where it might not be sin, but you're getting close. It's an elephant. It's a giant. Because the problem is when the giant is yelling, everything behind the giant is yelling too. But the moment it falls, everything else falls like dominoes. It's not what others say about you that matters. It's what you say about you. Listen, don't try to be somebody else. Don't run at your adversary with your mouth closed. And lastly, understand that it's in these battles, sometimes you feel like you don't have the weapons to fight. Goliath carried the sword that eventually killed him. Your adversary is carrying the weapon that God's going to use to deliver you. You see what I'm saying? No weapon formed against you will prosper, but the minute it gets in your hands, now everything you touch will prosper, says the Lord. You see what I'm saying? It's a total shift. It is a understanding that I don't have to have all the tools I just got to go to war and the minute I do my adversary is actually carrying what God's going to use to deliver me stand to your feet I want to read one more scripture then we're going to close David took the head of the Philistine verse 54 so David cut off Goliath's head and then he took his head wouldn't that be a pretty sight and he took it to Jerusalem. He took it to the center of the universe. But he put his armor in his tent. In other words, Goliath's head is the testimony that the giant had fallen. And David went and gave it to Jerusalem. He wasn't even king yet, but he gave it to Jerusalem. When you get the victory... You take your testimony and you give it away. But then he said, he kept the giant's armor. In other words, you give your testimony, but you keep your tools. When you fight, every battle provides you with more weaponry that will be used in the next fight. Years later, they're seeking to kill David and he doesn't have a sword and he goes and he gets Goliath's sword and defends himself. It was yesterday's battles that positioned you for today's victories. And it's today's battles that will position you for your next battle's victory. Last point I'm going to make. Number four, give your testimony. But keep the tools. You say, I don't want to be in a fight. 
You're going to fight till you get to heaven. That's just the way of it. But don't you spend one more minute being intimidated. The same God that delivered you before, the same God that delivered your mom and dad, the same God that delivered me, He's going to deliver you again. Don't you feel like you got to intimidate, you got to imitate everybody around you? My armor doesn't fit you. Your armor doesn't fit me. When the devil begins to tell you what he's going to do, or maybe this, a lot of times he'll try to remind you of your past. You can't do anything for God. They won't listen to you because you did this, you did that. You cussed in traffic. Micah cussed in traffic today. (laughs) When he tries to remind you of your past, you remind him of his future. This is the shift. Then you give that testimony. Keep the tools. Bow your head, please. Lord, we come to you today. And we commit to never be intimidated again. We commit, Lord God, to speaking your word over our life. To refusing to be an imitation of somebody else. We commit when the battle cry is given. That we will not sit idly by. And when victory When victory comes, we'll give the great testimonies of your victories and we'll keep the tools that we attain for the next battle. Now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and you say, Preacher, you know, I hear you, but I don't know where I stand with God. There's nothing more important to me than knowing that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's a book that's recorded in heaven and those whose names are listed in that book will spend eternity in heaven with Jesus and those that are not will spend eternity in hell separated from him. So if you're here today and you're not right with God, that's the first giant that needs to fall. If you say, I've never given my life to Jesus, I've never accepted his sacrifice, or you would say it like this, you say, I used to walk strong with him, but I'm backslidden. I'm like the prodigal son and I need to come home today. I need to get right with God. The Bible says no man knows the day nor the hour when their soul will be required of them. Today is the day of salvation. If that's you and you fall into any one of those categories and you know you need to get it right, nobody's looking around, I would never do anything to embarrass you, but we do want to give you the chance to make that decision today. So when I count to three, if that's you, I want you to lift your hand. And with an uplifted hand, you're saying, oh, God, remember me. And he really, really will. Today is your day. If that's you, you've never said yes to Jesus or you've backslidden. When I count to three, lift your hand. One, two, three. Lift your hand. I see that hand. Praise the Lord. I see that hand. 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 Thank you very much. Is there anyone else? Let today be the day that your mother's prayer is answered. Let today, I see that hand. Let today be the day that your father's prayer is answered, your grandmother's prayer. When you stop halfway doing it for God and you say, that's it, I'm going all the way in. I see that hand. God bless you, sir. All right, if you lifted your hand or you wanted to, I want you to pray this prayer after me. Matter of fact, church, help us pray. Say this. Say, oh God. I come to you now and I give you my life. I repent of my sins. I accept your gift of salvation. I'm a Christian now and I'll serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Praise God. Listen, if you made that decision today, there's a card in the seat in front of you. We'd love to hear about it. But your next step It's our unbroken faith class that takes place at 10.30 on Sunday mornings in the room behind the barn doors in the lobby. You'll learn all about what God's called you uh, to do next week. It's all about priorities. What are God's priorities? What would he have for me? Because listen, it's not just about a new life in heaven. It's a new life right now. 
and he will change everything from the top to the bottom and everything in between. Amen. Give God another hand of praise. Congratulations on a great decision to live for God. Let me ask one more question before we dismiss, though. If you're here today, you've never joined our church, but you know this is the house for you. You say, wow, I really sense the presence of God during worship. The preaching uh, really challenges me, and I just know that God has called me to be here. The Bible says this. Those that are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in God's courts. Every tree that gets uprooted begins to die. You have to stay planted if you want to increase. So if today's your first day here, or you've been coming for a while, but you know this is the church for you, I'm not going to call you to the front. There's no prerequisite required for you to join. But in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand and let us just celebrate that great decision with you. If you want to make New Heights Church your home and help us love people and point them to Christ, just lift your hand when I count to three. One, two, three. Lift your hands. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you guys. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Huge decision. Listen. I know you may have filled that card out a hundred times, but do this. Before you leave, fill it out one more time. Drop it by the tent. We have pens back there. I'm going to be at the tent. I'd love to meet you and just congratulate you on that great decision. Uh, also, if it's your first time here, I'd love to meet you as well. But fill that card out. Mark on there you'd like to be a member, and we'll get you all the information. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Let's all lift our hands. Father, for those who are joining the church, I thank you that they're now a partaker of every grace on this house. That they're going to help us love people and point them to Christ. That you're going to increase them. That you're going to make health the standard in their home. Now, Lord God, for every person under the sound of my voice, I pray that you would bless them in their coming in and their going out this day and every day. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. God bless you. Hey, guys. We just want to thank you for joining us online. We hope you enjoyed today's broadcast. Here at New Heights, we are passionate about two things, loving people and pointing them to Christ. So help us by liking, sharing, and commenting on everything you see come across our social media. It means the world to us. If you like what you've experienced today, you can also revisit this message you just watched or any other sermon at newheightschurch.info. We hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time.